Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Hello, it's my great pleasure today to invite uh, Professor Minghua Chen from Chinese University of Hong Kong to give a talk on capacity of large-scale CSMA wireless networks. Minghua got his bachelor and master degree from uh, Tsinghua University in 1999 and 2001. Then he go to UC Berkeley and got his PhD degree. Um, after UC Berkeley, Minghua spent one year at Microsoft Research as postdoc researchers, and then joined Chinese University of Hong Kong uh, in year 2007 as assistant professor. Minghua has won a series of prestigious award, award including the Elliott Jury Award from UC Berkeley, uh, ICME 209 Best Paper Award, and IEEE Transactional Multimedia uh, Best Paper Award. Uh, without further ado, let's hear Minghua's uh, uh, insight on how to uh, do uh, scheduling for uh, large-scale CSMA wireless networks. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Jim, for the introduction. Uh, it's always good to come back and um, you know, um, learn new things from the colleagues here and uh, share a little bit what we have been doing in the past year. Okay. So today, I'm going to... Uh, talk about how CSMA network can be made as good as a TDMA network and in a very simple manner. Okay. So this is a joint work with uh, Si Chao and Song Liu. Si Chao is currently with uh, UC uh, University of Lon College London and Song is my colleague in the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Okay. Okay. So what are the problems we are looking at? So we're looking at a large-scale wireless network when you have an N node randomly scattered around in an area of N. Okay? So as the number of nodes increase, the area also increases. So the density keeps the same. Okay? It is a wireless uh, network, so you have this uh, spatial interference. When one of the nodes is in transmission, a uh, radio range will cover uh, a, a, a sub-area of this entire area, and uh, consequently, there are some nodes is not a allowed to transmit simultaneously because otherwise they will interfere. Okay. So this is the key challenge. And the problem we study is that assume you have uh, n flows with randomly selected source and destination pair. Okay. And the question is that what is the throughput achievable for all the sessions? Okay. Different sessions may have different throughput, depends on whether uh, your source and destination are close to each other and so on and so forth. But we're asking what is the throughput that is achievable for all the sessions. So essentially the minimum of all the, all the, all, of all the sessions. Okay? So to do that, the key challenge is to, to handle the spatial, uh, spatial interference. And as a result, the scheduling is a key. The scheduling is to try to determine at any given time, which node is allowed to transmit and which node are not allowed to transmit and so on and so forth. Okay? So let's see two very popular scheduling. First one is TDMA. Okay, the other one in particular we study is uh, CSMA. The scheduling need to answer the question before they allow to one transmission. That is, if I'm going to transmit would I interfere any other transmission? Or would I be interfered? Okay. So in this particular case, there is two transmission that is ongoing. And this node in particular wants to decide whether or not I should transmit or not. He needs to consider, if I start to transmit, would I interfere other people's receiver? Okay. So in this case, this guy said, if you start to transmit, then I can receive. So you cannot transmit. And meanwhile, he also need to consider, if I start to transmit, would my receiver be upset by some ongoing transmission already? 
In this case, this transmitter will have the, uh, if you have a global information, then this transmitter will say, okay, I will interfere with you if you start to transmit. Okay, so your receiver can, cannot receive anything. Okay, so these are the two things uh, a transmit scheduling scheduler need to handle when they try to do the uh, transmission scheduling. Okay, and the TDMA, okay, is a concept. Let's say it says if you have the, all the global information, okay, then I can do scheduling perfectly. Before uh, I enable a transmission, I can always check globally whether or not this transmission will interfere with other trans ongoing transmission, and then I say yes or no. Okay, conceptually this is very powerful, but it's not very practical because as the network gets large, no matter you are uh, ad hoc network or you are Wi-Fi network with uh, access point that doesn't talk to each other, then uh, TDMA is not practically implementable. And on the other hand, CSMA has get very popular. Okay, it's because it's very practical and it gives other people a reasonable performance. The CSMA protocol is based is a distributed randomized scheduling. Okay, so when this uh, 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 node start to, before it want to transmit, he will do carry sensing. Okay, he sense whether or not there is other nearby ongoing transmission is going. And he would do, try to do a random collection of avoidance, and then he decide, okay, if everything is fine and I'm polite enough, then I start to talk, okay? And it is an echo-based bidirectional transmission because he don't have a global information whether or not his transmission is uh, successful at the receiver or not. So he required the receiver to send an egg packet to the sender so that the sender can know, okay, my transmission is successful, now I can move on to the next stage, okay? So these are the key, two key uh, components associated with CSMA protocol. In more detail, CSMA just do local decision, okay? And based on local information only, this is in contrast to the TDMA where you require the global information. In this three-node, uh, three-link example, the node transmitter A, B, C in a CSMA protocol, they will first start to count down according to a random counter. When A expires in this case, he starts to transmit. Okay? As A starts to transmit, B and C will sense A's signal, so they will freeze. They will continue countdown after A uh, finishes its countdown, uh, after its transmission. And in this case, B grab the channel and start to transmit. So the green means in transmission. Okay? And C and A are freezed, uh, represented by red color, and so on and so forth. So in this way, it is expected that CSM, CSMA on average would give equal chance to, for link A to transmit, for link B to transmit, and for link C to transmit. Okay? So this is uh, based on very simple idea. And this is the reason that makes CSMA uh, very popular because it's so simple that you can implement it uh, very well. Okay. So the question we're going to answer today is that what is the throughput capacity of CSMA? Our observation is that for wireless network with a TDMA scheduling, they are well studied. Starting from uh, 2000, the Gupta and Kumas results shows that the optimal throughput procession is scaled as order of one square root of n. Okay. This is a fundamental result, whether or not you like it or not. Okay. Somebody, some people don't like it because it says as the wireless network gets really large, your throughput goes to zero. Okay. But on the other hand, some people like it, say, it's, well, it's still one over square root of n, it's not one over n. Okay. So uh, nevertheless, re, uh, no matter you like it or not, this is fundamental result. But, CS, but this result is obtainable previously using a centralized scheduler, which means in order to achieve this uh, fundamental result, you need to have a centralized scheduler who has the global information can and coordinate the transmission uh, of all the nodes. But in practice, 
Distributed scheduling is very popular, like CSMA. So the uh, practical relevant question is that, what throughput can you get if you use distributed scheduler? Okay? And that is the question we're going to answer today. Okay? So before we dive into the detail, some take home message. First, CSMA can scale as well as TDMA. You didn't lose anything by using distributed scheduling. Okay? And today's CSMA, however, cannot achieve the optimal throughput. It can only achieve one over square root of n log n. There is a factor here. Okay. And to we show uh, a slightly modified CSMA scheme can achieve one over square root of n result. And that is not very difficult at all. And it's very implementable in our understanding. Okay. As a side product, we also have a result on how you can remove the hidden nodes for any, uh, any uh, CSMA network. Okay? Yes, sorry, yeah, um, yeah, it doesn't show, somehow the fonts doesn't show that it should be, uh, yeah. All right. Okay. <clears throat> so, how, what is our approach? We first need to model CSMA, right, since we are talking about CSMA. And then we look at a very special type of CSMA, which is hidden node free CSMA, <clears throat> which means in a CSMA network, you don't have any hidden node at all. Okay? And for this subclass of CSMA network, <clears throat> it turns out it can be understood easily. Okay? So we do a stationary analysis and find out the throughput of the, this CSMA network. Okay? And this throughput, is a function of a CSMA parameter. And then we tune the parameter to maximize the throughput. At the end, we found you can achieve 1 over square root of n. <coughs> Excuse me. What about exposed terminals? There can be exposed terminals? There could be exposure terminal. But otherwise, they are they're OK. So because exposed terminal just to reduce the entire throughput. You yeah. <coughs> yes. But then to achieve 1 over square root of n, we propose you should use a dual channel, dual carry sensing. That means we try to advocate from an architectural point of view. Later on, whenever we try to implement CSMA, perhaps we, can, we should always associate them with two channels rather than one channel today. Okay? Because at least that is what allows us to achieve 1 over square root of n in this case. Okay? Two transceiver only need one transceiver. One, trans one, 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 one receiver. receiver. Yeah, okay. uh, it's a half duplexing. So that means you don't need to receive or transmit simultaneously or two channels. Do you need to send two channels simultaneously? Yes, you do. Yes. Okay. Yes. But that is durable, as we show. Okay. okay. So any question before we move on? Okay. So let's uh, look at uh, modeling CSMA. So previously, on literature, uh, what people model is the uh, interference. Okay, they have this interference modeling. That means, uh, due to the spatial interference, two, uh, two transmissions are not possible if they are too close to each other. Okay. In the, this particular case, you just verify, you just check uh, the transmitter, okay, which is the blue node, to the receiver's re uh, distance. Okay. So in this particular example, this, uh, this data transmission is not, it will, is not allowed because the receiver, the distance between the receiver to the other transmitter is too close. Okay. And this is captured by uh, <clears throat> by a mathematical form, which we may not need to understand uh, very, uh, in order to, uh, to understand the later part of the work. But this model is first proposed by uh, Gupta and Kuma. Okay? And for, uh, for following this model, you, uh, following this uh, relationship, you can characterize the feasible state in, of a network. For instance, if uh, in a wireless network you have a set of links, okay, they are not simultaneously uh, possible under the interference constraint. In fact, 
if you apply this uh, Gupta and Kumar's uh, result, you will find uh, this is one of the possible, uh, one set of the possible links that can be simultaneously active. There are other links, they are not possible because they doesn't satisfy the interference uh, relationship. Okay. So this is how people uh, study the interference constraint. Okay. It means whenever you try to do scheduling, you need to satisfy this constraint, and as a result, some of the link cannot be simultaneously scheduled with other links. Okay. And this is for the uh, unidirectional communication, which means your receiver doesn't need to send you any acknowledgement. Okay. In the case your receiver needs to send you acknowledgement, the, uh, uh, the condition needs to modify a little bit, but still the, the high-level message is still both the receiver and transmitter need to be far away from other transmitter and receiver. Okay? So because beside the data transmission, now you ha also have the acknowledge transmission, which is sent from the receiver to the sender. So you have another additional case to consider when you try to set up the interference constraint for bidirectional communication. So easily, uh, you can imagine the constraint would be even stringer than the unidirection communication. Okay. Here's one, uh, here is the example. This is the unidirectional feasible state, okay? the same as the one we get from here. And if we apply this bidirectional communication uh, constraint, you will observe there's even less number of links can be simultaneously active. Okay? For instance, this link is allowed in unidirectional communication and it's no longer, no longer allowed in the bidirectional one. Okay? Okay, but our observation is that in the literature, people already consider interference constraint, okay? But how about the carry sensing constraint? Interference constraint is, in some sense, is the constraint allowed by physical law, okay? That means when, as long as you want to transmit, these are the physical uh, law that will guide whether or not your transmission is feasible. But carry sensing is more like a policy. Uh, proposed by local government, right? So your policy, the, the action allowed by your policy may not be the action allowed by physical laws, okay? So study the constraint allowed by physical law doesn't mean you study the policy allowed by local government, okay? So, uh, so this feasible state by carrying sensing decision is not captured before, and essentially, it only looks at uh, the local carry sensing information around the uh, transmitter, okay? The transmitter has a carry sensing range. That means any transmission, ongoing transmission inside this range, this guy can sense it. So when, whenever he senses it, he will, not try to, uh, he will try to avoid the collision by not transmitting, okay? So it itself has a carry sensing range and this range, um, it can, uh, this range is independent of the interference range. You can set the carry sensing range to very large, okay, so that you are very, very polite. Whenever you hear any, uh, any small uh, power that indicate other people are talking, then you start, start to shut up, okay. Otherwise, Whenever, if you set the carry sensing range very, very small, then you are very, very aggressive in trying to transmit, okay? This is independent of uh, whether or not your transmission will upset other transmission or will be upset by other ongoing transmissions, okay? And this can be captured using some mathematical form, which we will not dive into detail. But the important thing I want to point out here is that First, the carry sensing range is independent of the inter, uh, transmission range and interference range. And second, this decision is made by the transmitter locally only. Okay. In all the previous uh, situation, you are involving the receiver to do the decision as well. Okay. Whenever receiver say, hey, I cannot receive uh, this signal, uh, uh, if you transmit, then the transmitter will not start to transmit. Okay. So, 
Previous model all involved transmit uh, receiver, but the carry sensing model only involved uh, uh, the transmitter. Okay. Okay. Big picture. Interference model capture the global spatial interference. Carry sensing model, they try to infer what's going on globally by using only local knowledge. Of course, some, sometimes you make a mistake okay, and cause mismatch. And then that mismatch is the reason be, uh, why the hidden node problem will appear. Okay. Next, we'll go to the uh, hidden node problem. So any question before we move on to that? Okay, what is hidden node problem? So the hidden node problem happens when the carry sensing decision says you can transmit, but the global interference uh, relationship says your inter you will cause interference. Okay? Here's one particular example. We have two links, this uh, link and this particular link. Okay? Suppose this uh, carry sensing range which is the blue, uh, blue circle. Uh, the blue carry sensing range is RCS. CS is carry sensing. And because th this transmitter is outside the carry sensing range of this transmitter, so they cannot sense each other. Okay? So they start to transmit simultaneously, which is, in this case, OK, because it turns out the receiver, both receiver can receive, uh, 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 receive the data safely. However, when the second link tries to send an ACK packet to the transmitter, he, is, he will interfere the data transmission from the sender to the receiver in this particular case. Okay? To see that, just observe this uh, circle with the that dot. Okay? And this is the interference range for this particular receiver. And you will see this. Uh, the second receiver is within the interference frame. Okay. That means when these guys start to transmit, this guy will interfere. Okay. And this shows one example where your transmission, the bidirectional transmission, is not allowed by the uh, interference constraint, but is allowed by the uh, carry sensing constraint. Okay. Any questions? OK, so the implication is that uh, the hidden node problem, oh, OK, so there is typo here. Uh, that means uh, for this hidden node problem, they, they prevent the CSMA to, to work along with the physical law. OK, so the first thing we want to do is that we want to make the CSMA to go along with the physical law first, and then we start this particular good behavior CSMA. Okay? And remark, uh, for some people uh, uh, more familiar with the practical implementation, we remark that hidden node problem cannot be completely eliminated, even if you use RTS and CTS. Okay? This is uh, uh, one result uh, from Professor Gerlach uh, from uh, UCLA. Okay? So could you, could you give me an example where, where that doesn't okay. solve the problem? Yes, good. So for the RTS CTS to be very effective, it is uh, um, your transmitter and receiver need to, the system need to be time synchronized. Because consider this case. Um, uh, so before a transmitter try to transmit the data, he will send an RTS, right? But when he sends the RTS, he has no idea whether or not his receiver is currently interfered with other receiver or not. So when he sends the RTS and the receiver start to send the CTS, then the CTS will interfere with other people's transmit, right? transmission. Yes. So you're saying that, that when the CTS is transmitted, yes. that those other receivers may not, may, not be receive, may not be able to receive it because they might be transmitting? Yes, that is the first case. Yeah, and the second case, when you reply the CTS back, you may interfere with other ongoing, ongoing transmission, okay. which the transmitter doesn't know because it's the, from the receiver point of view, you will interfere with other people. Right, right. 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 so they don't get the CTS. Yeah. Okay. 
Right. The main and issue is time synchronization. Yeah. Right? So the, there is a paper showing that if you are time synchronized globally, then you can use the some very small slot to transmit the CTS, trans, do the RTS and CTS transmission. And in this slot, there is no uh, data transmission is allowed. So the situation I mentioned just now would, would not appear, which is uh, your CTS never interfere with the data transmission. Yeah. Length of the SIF and the diff, is that how that's achieved? Uh, you mean in, when, when there is time synchronized or without oh, time? I, I, I understand what you mean. Uh, time synchronization sort of is when everybody's working off the beacon. I'm wondering, yeah. I thought that the reason why they had the diff longer than the SIF was to prevent the risk of a collision with a, a you know, with the because you have to wait a diff plus a backup period before you transmit. Yeah. So I thought that was why the, the, there wasn't a collision when the, 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 the clear descent is sent. It's because that's sent within a SIF, and a SIF is shorter than a diff. Yeah, so I was just, I, I, yeah. but I don't know the, the analysis behind it. Right. I, I just thought, I thought that was my understanding. Right, so the, uh, so the, the, the high level observation that people have is that if you don't have the time synchronization, and uh, then the current RTS CTS could not resolve the hidden node problem. Yes, right. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. But however, uh, it is. Uh, we found that uh, you can be very very polite, setting the carry sensing range uh, conservative enough to resolve the hidden node, hidden node problem. Okay. So. Uh, here I'll give you one example. Okay. Suppose you have a data transmission, two data transmission that is allowed. Uh, suppose your carry sensing range, okay, which is uh, this uh, dash circle, is really, really large. Okay. It's really, really um, try to be very, very polite. Then if it is allowed by the carry sensing uh, decision, when this tooling can be simultaneously active, then what does it imply? Imply if you have uh, there is only four possible combination of this transmission. You have uh, two data, or uh, one data, one egg, right? And one data, uh, one data, one egg, and two egg. Okay, and that is covered by the, all these four situation. And uh, if you have a uh, two data, because you are very very polite, your carry sensing range is so large, so that when two transmitters are allowed, they are, their receiver must already separate by a very sufficient gap already. So these two situation is allowed. And when you have a data and egg, you look at the receiver that receive the data, and the receiver is sent by the egg, and their distance is still larger than what is, uh, possible, uh, what is uh, uh, allowed by the uh, global uh, interference relationship. This is because I already do, when I do carry sensing, I already be very, very polite, okay? Maybe this link is in Seattle and this link is in San Francisco. I'm so polite so that I, I won't transmit even if a San Francisco link is start to transmit, okay? Then it's, it can be, it's reasonable that even no matter what you do in San Francisco, it's going to be okay with the link in Seattle, right? So it's so the distance is so long. You are so polite, okay? So uh, it's not difficult to check um, for, for all the four cases. You will all have the uh, decision allowed by the carry sensing this uh, carry sensing operation is also allowed by the global interference operation, okay? Okay. Any question before we move on? So this would be, well, if I understand you correctly, you're saying that by doing your carrier sensing bigger than the cell radius, like if yeah. you double it, yes. then you're basically covering anybody who might be in an adjoining yes. cell. Right. Great. Okay. Yeah. Makes sense. In this case, in particular, this case, it will be three times uh, as the transmission rate. Three times, yeah. yeah. OK. So, uh, so, what is, so by doing so, 
if we set this carriage engine good enough, then we can construct a wireless network, CSMA wireless network without hidden node. So what is so great about it? Of course, first, uh, your hidden node free CSMA network is more fair in terms of uh, you don't, uh, some of the link will not suffer in uh, collision due to hidden node, so they get higher throughput. And mathematically, that makes the throughput more analytical, uh, analytically accessible. Because now every decision allowed by uh, CSMA is going to be allowed by the physical law. Okay? That is uh, one very good thing. And under this situation, we found that, uh, and, uh, and many other researchers also view that, is that CSMA can be viewed as uh, simulating uh, global dynamics in a con continuous time. So global dynamics is uh, one, um, one form that physics uh, try to maximize the global uh, energy by doing each individual item is doing something locally. Okay, so it has, you can see it has some flavor as the CSMA, and you can use the Markov chain based analysis to, to do the analysis. Okay, and we show that for hidden node free CSMA, it can, actually can obtain the optimal possession throughput. Okay, it's order of one over square of n. And we also show that this is not achievable by today's CSMA. And after slight modification, you can achieve this throughput. Okay. And that is going to be the focus in the next uh, 10 slides. When you say okay. hidden node free CSMA, uh, are you basically mean you enlarge the sensing cycles, circles, to yes. basically OK? Yes. And you basically said it can achieve the optimal throughput? Yes, otherwise. Okay. So I have a, a question. If you do that, which, which I think is a really innovative idea, mm. what does it do to your frequency reuse plan? Okay. Because you know, you're going to be re trying to reuse your frequency some distance away. Yes. And, and in most 802.11 networks, they use a frequency reuse of three. Yes. So you're going to have things that are really close on the same frequency. Yes. So does that impact your yes. efficiency? Yes. So although your order wise is uh, the same as TDMA, but the constant is uh, going to suffer. You're going to suffer some constant dis difference, right? Right. right. Yeah. So uh, that is uh, uh, that. Of course, is uh, uh, one of the future direction we are currently looking at. The main thing uh, that essentially, we if we want to answer that question, perhaps we want to look at. What if you have a CSMA network with hidden node? Okay, because by reducing the range, you allow the more frequency reuse. But at the meanwhile, uh, perhaps you will have uh, um, more hidden node because your current sensing range is not large enough. Okay, so then the question is that how can we understand that kind of network? Yes, in this work, we only shows that uh, if you have a hidden node free then you are still OK. You are only constantly different from the TDMA network. Right? Mm -hmm. So beyond that, we have, don't have any answer at this moment. Yeah, but it's a very good question. Yeah. OK, okay. so CSMA, if you have a network without hidden node, you can uh, study the throughput of this CSMA link by, through a Markov chain. So what is this Markov chain? Remember the CSMA, every link, uh, they are, every link before they transmit, they need to count down. Okay? And if they sense other people is in transmission, he will freeze. And after he finished the freezing, he will continue to count down. As the countdown expires, he will start to transmit. Okay? Okay. So the Markov chain is, uh, can be viewed as this uh, polar graph where you have a three link, link A, link B, and link C, okay? At one, any given time, only one of the link is active, okay? In this case, B is active. And after B is acti uh, finished its transmission, you go back to a state when no link is in transmission because maybe everybody is, is now still in the countdown stage. And when the one of the countdown expire, and one of the links start to transmit, in this case, uh, C. So, what happened in the future only depends on what happened in the present. Okay? It's independent of whether or not your previous state is B is in transmission, C is transmission, and A is in transmission. Okay? So 
Uh, so this network seems to evolve in a, uh, in a Markov uh, chain guided uh, uh, behavior, okay? Um, so after you set up this connection, you can, you can use the uh, uh, Markov chain study to find out the throughput of this, uh, uh, of this uh, CSME network. Uh, the particular stage, uh, I brief a little bit here, but it's not required to understand our uh, main result. You have a set of uh, link, link A, link B, and link C. The first step is the, to abstract uh, the, uh, the, all the independent set allowed in this network. And then for this independent set, you form a Markov chain where the state are all the independent set. So in this particular case, there is a five independent set. Okay. And then you draw the transition probability rate among them. And now you form a Markov chain. After you form a Markov chain, then you, we can study the steady state distribution because the Markov chain will converge to a steady state distribution. And we found the link throughput when they reach this uh, steady state. Okay. That is the, uh, the main idea behind that. And, um, and in particular, you can have uh, this particular form uh, of, uh, of the, this is the probability for each independent set to be active in, the, uh, in that steady state. And following this result, you can compute the link throughput for CSMA, okay? So the question. I just want to yeah. make sure I understand. So this I'm not familiar with the, the mark of chain. Uh -huh. So this is assuming a stationary environment, like n n all the um, transmitters are not moving. Right. And so it, over time, it, it settles itself. Right. Optimizes. Okay. Right. Okay. So yes. Mm -hmm. Right. And the details are not important. Perhaps the most important result is that we show that, and many other people as well. Okay. Well, a, a several group of people. Uh, any rate that you can support by TDMA, you can achieve by CSMA. Okay, so th this result we think is quite uh, interesting because this is the connection between the um, centralized scheduler to a distributed scheduler. Okay, and this result is first shown by uh, Zhang and Warren uh, in 2008, and then later on. Uh, also, there's uh, other people who try to understand the result from a different angle. And now we are pretty much has a, a very good understanding on what's going on there. Okay. So, but uh, practically, this is, I think, the uh, pretty interesting message. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Sure. Really what, are the, what are the variables here that, that are causing the thing to stabilize? And, and I was trying to work out how quickly it stabilized. Okay. Good question. Uh, it, uh, what are the uh, what are the variable to um, so what are the variable that control is uh, convergence right so yeah. um, so actually that is uh, controlled by the structure of the Markov chain well, in other words it's controlled by the topology of the original wireless network okay you mean where the receivers are yeah where the where the transmit where, where the node position oh, okay. yes okay. so and. Uh, Know the position, there is a topology, that's number one. And second is that the, the countdown rate, the, the countdown rate of the CSMA network. So the, each node, before they start to transmit, they have a countdown window, right? So current CSMA is like you choose from 0 to 32, randomly choose one and start to count down, right? When the countdown expires, you start to transmit. So this window size can also affect the, how, how fast you converge. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay, so the shorter the window, the quicker the convergence? Uh, doesn't necessarily, <laughs> right, no, right, right. So yeah, it depends on the uh, the structure of the wireless network. In some sense, when you try to count down very aggressively, uh, you are very likely to uh, uh, get checked into some local optimal, which means uh, you will converge faster, but may not necessarily to a point where it's good for everybody. Oh. Yes. So there is a, there is a slight trade-off there, yes, right. But this is a very uh, very interesting question. Yeah. Any other questions?
Okay, so uh, now what we know is that uh, if you have a, a rate, let's say a throughput, a capacity that you can allow by uh, supported by TDMA, then somehow CSMA can also achieve it. Okay. Now let's uh, turn outside to TDMA a little bit to see what are the insight people gave on how TDMA can achieve the one over square root of n result, and then see how we can tune the result to CSMA. Okay. So the average case analysis is you have a random network, and uh, you want to understand the throughput. And the Gupta and Kumar shows that the throughput capacity per source destination pair is uh, 1 over square root of n. And Fran uh, Franceschi in his 06 paper shows that this, this upper bound is indeed achievable. And they provide a, a TDMA scheme to do so. Okay. And so the question is that, uh, can you still achieve this result? And we show that to achieve that, you need to use dual carry sensing threshold implement in two frequency channels. Okay. So a little bit of uh, intuition on how this overall scheme could work. So let's uh, look at the Gupta Kumas bound of capacity. Gupta and Kumas imply that multi-hop short range transmission is always good than a single hop long range transmission. Okay. It's just like when we go to have a dinner, right? So um, we, we try to lower down our voice so that we don't interfere with other people in the restaurant. But it's good enough for us to do a short range communication. So in this, in this analogy, you allow more people to talk to each other in a short range, but you prevent, but you don't prefer a lot of uh, one people just shout to the entire audience. Then nobody else can, can talk, OK? So uh, for instance, in this particular network, okay, you can, there is many short range transmission is allowed. But also, you can do one long range transmission. Suppose you want to transmit from here to here. Okay. If you just use one long range transmission, then every other people in this range needs to shut up. Because if they start to speak, they will interfere with you. Okay. And because the uh, the distance for any randomly cho chosen pair in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in, in the area of n is on the order of uh, square root of n, then you essentially cover a huge number of uh, 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 nodes in this area. Okay? Rather, in, for you to talk to your destination, it's good for you to uh, talk to your nearest neighbor and your neighbor talks to his neighbor, and neighbor talks to neighbor, and find this a short range transmission, castigate together to form a path. So you do a multi hop transmission, and this is turn out to, the, to be the optimal. So, what is uh, the, how many hops do you need to transmit? It turns out in random network is an uh, order of a square root of n. Okay, it's the diagonal, right? So you have an uh, area of n, you have a rectangle. So the area is n, and the, at the diagonal is a square of n, okay, on the order of square of n. And your density is fixed, so along this square of n uh, distance, you will have a square of n hops. So you transmit, to transmit one bit from the source to destination, you need to transmit the, use the network resource square of n times. Okay? So the throughput is thus 1 over square of n. You transmit one bit by using square of n bits of a network resource. Okay. And so that is the intuition behind the Gupta and Kumas result. And n is the number of nodes. Yes, n is number of nodes. Yes. Okay. And then uh, the Franceschi come out with a scheme saying that uh, this uh, upper bound is indeed achievable. Okay. Uh, they do so by looking at the uh, ge geometry of the, uh, of the wireless network. So suppose you have a random wireless network. Okay. The node is randomly, uniformly scattered around uh, in the area. Okay. 
uh, in their paper, they assume this is Poisson point process, which is the limit of the random scattering uh, uh, process. And you can, the, they, uh, they, want, they un understand this question, okay? So will you be able to find at least one node as n goes to infinity as you look at different size of cell, okay? So they chop the network into this multiple cell as you can see, some of the cell contain some nodes, some didn't, right? So you can increase the size of the cell from the very small one to a larger scope and to a further larger scope. As, as you increase the size of the cell, you can imagine the probability for you to see at least one node will increase, right? So uh, they try to understand, okay, uh, what is the size of the cell should I look at in order to have one node inside, okay? If every box is a square order of a square of n, you will find the one. If the, uh, you look at a very small cell, the probability that we will find a, a node in every cell is zero. Okay, just show by here. If you look at a very small cell, you'll find it as zero. Okay. And it turns out, if you increase the cell size to log n, then you have high probability every cell will have at least one node, okay? okay? Then essentially you form a grid network, and for any transmitter, to uh, any send source to transmit any data to the receiver, you can do the Manhattan routing. That means you first go horizontally to the cell, which is, has the same column as your destination, and then you hop in a, vertically to the destination. So each length of uh, each hop is log n, okay? And this can be shown that uh, in this way, your throughput is one order of uh, one over square of n log n. The log n come from, for each step, you need to jump log n, uh, log n step, uh, log n distance. Okay, but more, more interestingly, uh, Francesti shows that by using the percolation, you can show if a network, you randomly put a lot of nodes onto it, they will automatically form a sort of a backbone, okay? This is given by nature. You don't need to construct it, you are given. The backbone is constructed of a multiple nodes, okay, in an adjacent cell, and their distance is order of one, okay? You don't, you don't need to jump from here to here, okay? This is not backbone, but they show that they must exist at least one backbone where the number of nodes are connected within only uh, order of one distance, okay? So this is called a backbone. And because the distance is short, that means you can do uh, you can pack more transmission on the backbone, right? So range is good. So you pack more transmission along the backbone and so that the backbone can really carry, uh, uh, really is, uh, can, can provide a good uh, transmitter throughput from one node in the backbone to the, red, uh, to the other side of the backbone, mainly because their distance are short, okay? So this is compared to the previous result where, where you chop the cell into large cell, log n cell, and each step you jump log n distance, okay? And, and in this way, you, you sort of uh, have uh, less spatial reuse because you cover more uh, area. So that your throughput is low. In the backbone case, uh, it's similar to pr the previous case except now every steps, okay, every step, every hop, you need, the range is order one. So you increase the spatial reuse a lot, okay, by a factor of log n, okay. So this means if I want to transmit from one node on the backbone to the other node in the backbone, I can do it on the order, uh, I can do it in a, in a uh, pretty high throughput uh, manner. So how about the node that is not on the backbone? Well, on that case, you just uh, use this uh, uh, 
you just uh, hook up the node is not on the backbone to a node on the backbone. And this node first transmits something onto the backbone, and then the packet routes through the backbone to the destination, and then offload to the, to the destination. Okay. So the main insight in the paper is says that this backbone is given. So even if you don't want it, it is there anyway. Okay. okay. So exactly this is how they achieve the throughput of order one square of n. You form the backbone. You find the dist. Uh, you you hook up the node, the the call it countryside node. Okay, to the backbone. Okay, and when the countryside node want to transmit, you transmit onto the backbone go through the backbone and offload to the countryside. Okay. In this case, uh, you can show the bottleneck is on uh, the flow competing the backbone. And on average, there are square of n flows competing one backbone link. So the throughput is bounded by order of one square of n, and it's achievable. Okay. okay. So how do we going to adopt uh, this scheme in CS TDMA to CSMA? We are going to adopt the same backbone peripheral routing scheme. Okay. We throw the nodes uh, in automatic will from backbone. Okay. So we're going to use it. And we'll tune the carry sensing range so there is no hidden node. And then we'll uh, tune the countdown window of the CSM TDMA to achieve the order of one square of throughput. Okay. And this is to uh, and and to accommodate this uh, short range uh, backbone transmission and long range uh, backbone to countryside transmission. Then we essentially need to detect two type of transmission. Okay. Because when we do backbone to backbone transmission, we need to be polite to the backbone. Okay. Backbone to countryside transmission, we need to be polite to the countryside. Okay. So there is two set of different requirements. And you at a, any given time, as a sender, as a transmitter, you don't know what is the type of ongoing transmission. Okay, because you don't have the global information. And uh, so you need to do a dual carry sensing based on local information is uh, is kind of difficult okay and that's why we propose you should use a dual channel dual carry sensing you use the backbone uh, the blue channel for the backbone transmission so now by 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 knowing uh, which uh, whether or not there is a, a power you receive on the uh, blue channel you can know whether or not there is ongoing um, backbone to backbone transmission. And by listening on the green channel, you can then also determine whether or not there is some transmission ongoing from the backbone to the countryside. Okay? And this, the channel just identify what type of transmission is ongoing so that you can adapt. Okay? You can do carry sensing. <clears throat> okay? And uh, so I will not dive into the detail, but the main message is that if you do so, you can achieve the optimal throughput, 1 over square of n. Okay. So how are the backbone nodes picked? OK, good question. There is a distributed algorithm where they form the backbone automatically. Yeah, not perfect, but you can find it, yes. So there is a dual channel and dual carry sensing. Uh, as Jim asked a question at the very beginning, at the very beginning, do you require two receiver to receive receiver to receive from two channels simultaneously? The the the, the answer is no. Okay, you can use a imply, you can use a a a, a low cost solution which allowed only the half duplexing, okay, across frequency channel, and you can still achieve the optimal scaling law result. In the in the du hub duplexing, when you are transmitting on one, uh, when you are transmitting on one uh, one of the receiver, uh, so one of the channel, you cannot do anything on the other channel. Okay, or even if you just carry sense there is a transmission ongoing on the one of the channel in this green channel, you don't you cannot do any transmission on the blue channel as well. Okay, 
So it's a very stringent requirement that's made the uh, implementation actually easier than, 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 than what we uh, want in the optimal case. Uh, but the information is that nevertheless, otherwise, the, the throughput, optimal throughput scheduling is still achieved. Okay. Okay. If the channels are next to each other, why you shouldn't be able to receive on both channels simultaneously? It's, it should be fairly easy to build a radio that does that, right? Right. Oh, uh, that's a good question. Um, but actually, it depends on the power leakage. So, uh, so theoretically, you can always build a, a band, band filter, right, to filter only the uh, the signal that you want from a particular channel. However, in practice, it's very difficult to build a very ideal filter to filter the band. Yeah. Yes. The band right. Yes. Yeah. So you're yeah. going to have a leakage onto other channel, which might cause the receiver to cannot decode its signal on the other receiver. Right. Okay. If, you, if you have the situation where you cannot transmit onto the other channel, the other one is busy, then that takes your throughput down, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Right. That's excellent question. Yes, yeah, definitely. We don't know how to handle it. Um, Maybe this is uh, this is mainly. I think I my personally, I my understanding is this is uh, you know this uh, in implementation issue. So unless we have a good way to allow you to receive and transmit on two channels simultaneously, I don't know how to resolve this one. Yeah. So there is uh, some related work. Uh, from Gupta and Kumar and Franceschi, and for uh, some of the results from uh, Warren and his student Li Bin. Li Bin is actually uh, from, also from the Chinese University of Hong Kong, and he's currently in UC Berkeley. And uh, also, people also uh, propose a uh, Aloha type of protocol, which can also achieve all the one square of n result, but their capacity definition is not the uh, traditional one that we'll discuss here. And there is other simple results on uh, how you can use a queuing model to, uh, uh, to describe, to obtain the bound, the capacity bound, but it doesn't give any result on how you can achieve the bound. Okay, okay so some recap. Uh, I hope I described to some extent how a CSM light network can scale as well as the optimal TDMA network. Okay. The scheme we describe is on building a hidden node-free uh, wireless network. This uh, necessarily reduces the uh, capacity of the entire network. But we show this, uh, redu this reduction is not otherwise. Okay. And we propose, we advocate that we should associate two frequency channels simultaneously with a CSMA node. That is because from the uh, throughput analysis, we found this way give us an easy way that can achieve the order optimal result. Okay? And we said we want to tune the CSMA countdown window adaptively, and this is along the recent, uh, uh, recent work uh, done by uh, several group of researchers. And we need a proper routing scheme, which is the backbone uh, peripheral routing. And looking into the future, um, we believe that the dual carrier sensing dual channel scheme applied to arbitrary finite network, and we want to do more uh, experiments and simulation to find out how this scheme actually uh, is performed uh, in practice. And that's all my talk. Uh, that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. So any questions? Well, maybe we can uh, bring the question offline. And uh, uh, Minghua is a Kanali researcher with us. And he will be here till the end of May, May 28th. So uh, if you have questions, feel free to talk to him. Yeah.
So is your, uh, we use this email address. You don't have a Microsoft email while you're here. Uh, there is uh, uh, basically a Gmail uh, account uh, which you can use to communicate. I think you also have a B dash account. Yeah. I'm not sure how much you check for that emails. Uh, I haven't been able to log into into account yet. Okay. So, <laughs> right. The password sometimes. Uh, so last time we tried the password, it doesn't work. Right. Maybe so. if you want to talk to me, should the email to me. My alias is Jiayanyao. I'm the host for the talk. So oh, you are. So I can just check the medium yeah. right. That'd be great because I'd love a, one of those references. I was wondering if you could just send it to me on the back burn. Okay. That was fascinating. No problem. Yes. Uh, are you here in research? Or, I mean, no. Okay. No. <laughs> uh, I mean, which group are you working in? I actually work in Windows. It's okay. just I come out of the wireless industry. Okay. Okay. I don't okay. work on wireless. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I thought this was the best talk I've ever been to. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> great, Thank you. great stuff. <laughs> Thank you. I think this has great application in um, the mesh networking stuff that's going on, the digital home mm -hmm. and the digital office environment. I think this is a great practical application. Okay. To do that. Thank you very much. It's very exciting. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Yeah.